Have you ever seen an emergency broadcast system signal on your television? Seven vertical bars of various colors blast onto your screen accompanied by an ear-piercing tone that is impossible to ignore. A robotic voice will often interrupt the shrill cry with a message indicating the variety of emergencies for your location. Thunderstorms, tornadoes, flash flooding, you know the type. My town has the same federal emergency system as yours. What we have that yours likely doesn't is a local emergency warning broadcast. It does not cover weather-related emergencies or Amber Alert notifications. We still take cover when it arrives, but most of us have never seen what we are hiding from. The first emergency alert I can remember happened when I was five or six years old. I'm not completely sure, but it also isn't terribly important. Talking puppets on a PBS show were teaching me ABCs and how to count to ten, and I was enraptured. The huge yellow bird was talking to me about ways to be kind to new friends when the screen began to crackle with a static, and the picture began to skip. Pink and yellow vertical bars filled the old television screen. A high-pitched whine poured from the speakers, and I can still remember covering my ears in terror. Nothing like that had ever happened before. Maybe my parents had discussed this with me, but my memory doesn't seem to be able to recall having been warned about it before. With my ears covered, I could still hear the overpowering hum. It seemed to be getting louder. Feeling a tap on my shoulder and turning my head, I could see my mother and father behind me, beckoning me to follow them. My father had a storm radio clutched in his right hand that was almost certainly blasting the same warning tone as the television. I awkwardly raised myself off of the floor while still holding my ears and following them. We walked from the living room, through the dining room, and onto the back porch. Dad pulled the metal hatch doors to the storm cellar open and wavered my mother and me inside. Once I began toddling down the stairs, I removed my hands from my ears to grasp onto the banister. The humming was still pouring from the radio, but the volume was turned down, and it no longer hurt my ears. Is bad weather coming? I had asked my mother in confusion. The window shades were open in the living room that day, and I can still recall the bright rays of sunshine stretching toward me on the carpeted floor. It looked nice outside. My mother turned her head towards me and held up a finger to her mouth. We continued down the storm cellar steps in silence, but for the emergency tone. Behind us, my father pulled the cellar doors shut. I could hear him sliding latches into place, followed by the flicking up padlocks. After he secured the door, he came to the bottom of the stairs and guided us toward a secondary room in the cellar. As my father began to chain and bolt the door to the room, my mother set the radio down on an old table, sat in a worn armchair, and pulled me close to her chest. All of these decades later, I can still remember feeling her pulse hammer in my ear. Her breathing was rapid, and she held me so tightly I was scared I wouldn't be able to catch my breath. It's going to be okay, baby, my mother said with a shaking voice. This is just something we have to do here sometimes to stay safe. What are we hiding from? I asked, juvenile fear mounting. My mother was opening her mouth to respond when my father made a shushing noise. He pointed toward the weathered alert radio on the table. The tone had now shifted from a droning whine into prolonged bursts. A robotic male voice began to speak after the last burst. This is a message from the emergency alert system of the Alistair Valley Safety and Protection Board. At this time, please seek shelter in a basement, storm shelter, or interior room of your house without windows. This is a level 2 watch. I repeat, this is a level 2 watch. No entities have yet been spotted. Unusual activity has been reported on Palumbo Street and Slate Street. Remain indoors and away from the windows until you receive an all-clear message from this channel. The same mechanical message played in a rotation, punctuated with the pulsing whine. My mother continued pressing me to her chest, and the rhythmic beat of her heart and the gentle lullaby she sang had eventually caused me to drift off to sleep. My mother and father never told me what we were hiding from that day. But I knew to fear it. I'm no less terrified today than I was as a child.
As I ate my breakfast the next morning, I can remember listening to the local AM news on the radio. My father was cooking breakfast as my mother and I sat at the table reading a Berenstain Bears book when the DJ fell silent. When his husky voice returns to the air, he announced that a little girl named Margaret Cupsworth had gone missing the day before. No search effort will be made as the circumstances of her disappearance are well understood to our town, the man said. A memorial for Margaret will be held at the Hall Street Elementary School gym this evening. In lieu of flowers, the family requests donations are made to Alistair Valley Safety and Protection Board. My family went to the memorial service that evening. I had never worn a tie before, but my mother had taken me to the local department store and purchased one. When we arrived, I remember thinking that the entire town must have shown up. A huge line was formed to comfort the family as they stood by a flower-lined photo of their daughter. Margaret smiled at the camera in her pink-flowered dress, eternally happy, eternally young. Margaret had been in preschool with me. She was not a close friend at that age. I was still firmly in the phase of life where girls were gross and scary. Still, I remember being sad that she was gone. Not that I entirely understood at the time she was dead. Mom and Dad had explained to me on the way to the memorial that people who don't get inside when the emergency alert sounded were never seen again. They never clearly stated that it meant they were dead. As I grew older, I came to understand that was the likeliest outcome. My family reached the front of the receiving line, and my father prompted me to shake hands with Mr. Cupsworth. He looked angry and sad all at once. When he took my hand, he shook it gently and nodded to me. My eyes welled with tears, grief radiated from him. Even at my young age, I could feel the despair. Mom comforted Miss Cupsworth, so I continued down the line. Beside her mother stood a little girl, her red face streaked with tears. She couldn't have been more than four. To this day, I will never understand why they made her stand there in her sorrow and face a town full of people who could not comfort her. Hi, I said meekly. Was Margaret your sister? The girl nodded her head, but didn't say a word. She was real nice, I stammered. She was in my class. The little girl sobbed loudly and wrapped her arms around me. My arms were pinned to my side, and I was mortified. But I stood there and let her squeeze my chest. Mama told her not to play so far from the house. The little girl cried. She knew she wasn't allowed to go that far. That was the day I met Paige Cupsworth. She ended up being my high school sweetheart. Short and feisty. Smart as a whip. I probably would have married her too. Unfortunately... Alistair Valley and its cursed sirens had no respect for the hopes and dreams of its citizens. Four years of college was the only break I ever received from the intermittent emergency signals from my hometown. A few times a year there would be a national weather service alert on campus, and whilst most of my classmates seemed unconcerned, I was always the oddball. The first time it happened, I ran out of my English 102 class and sprinted to the boiler room in the basement of the class hall. It was embarrassing, to say the least. Some of my friends in the class called my cell phone to ask if I was okay, and when I explained to them that this was normal protocol in my hometown, they seemed confused. I considered trying to explain the Alistair Valley safety and protection warnings to them, but it was clear they didn't have similar experiences growing up. Paige and I talked on the phone every night, and visited on as many weekends as my scrawny bank account would allow. Mom helped out where she could, but I had to work most weekends to make enough money to cover expenses. Dad had passed away unexpectedly my freshman year, and the money was tight for her. I still feel as though if I had gone home more often, maybe Paige would still be here. It took me a few more alarms to fight the urge to hide in a subterranean, windowless room, but eventually, I was able to control my urges. Tornadoes were very uncommon in the area, and the alerts I would receive on my cell phone were generally just to let you know bad weather was on the way. It didn't always indicate a need to take shelter. 
Those may have been the only completely relaxed years of my life. Early in my last semester of college, I could tell Paige was becoming despondent. She was attending a community college in the next county over from Alistair Valley. I had begged and pleaded with her to transfer to the state college with me, but she wisely declined. All of the courses she needed for her degree were available at a much lower cost there. Are you coming back to the Alistair Valley after you graduate? She asked one night on the phone. More likely than not, I replied. Now with Dad gone, I think Mom probably needs more help, so I hate to be far away. Besides, you seem pretty set on being a social worker there, and I'd like to think I fit somewhere in your five-year plan. She paused longer than I was comfortable with. We had talked about marriage in an abstract way since I had graduated high school, but I had never made any official declarations. The silence had been unnerving. Paige, I said. Are you still there? Yeah, she said flatly. I'm here. I'm not planning on getting rid of you anytime soon unless you act up. Sometimes I just think, you know, we could start over somewhere else. I was surprised to hear she was considering moving away. She had always talked about her career plans in the community. Enrolling in college so close had allowed her to be with her parents. It wasn't as though I had considered venturing elsewhere, but Alistair Valley had always seemed to be our future together. I'm not saying no, I responded. Just... Uh, kind of surprised, I guess. What has you thinking of leaving now? I want to have kids someday, Chris. She said. I don't want to have to worry that what happened to Margaret will... She began to cry softly and didn't finish the sentence. I reassured her as best I could, but it never seemed to be much use in those days. More and more of our conversations had turned to Margaret that semester. While she was a fleeting memory to me from my childhood school days, she was an ever-present thought for Paige. Every time the warning message sounded in town, she would call me. Whenever another citizen of Alistair Valley went missing during the emergency alert, Paige would recount all of the details she knew during our calls. All of these conversations were punctuated by Margaret. My heart ached for her, but it seemed to be growing into a weight she wasn't able to shoulder. More frequently, she began to ask what I thought was outside during the alerts, and I told her honestly that I didn't know. The alerts and warnings from my parents had always been enough to keep me inside. Sometimes, during the sirens, I can hear a little girl talking to me. She told me one night. Dad would yell for her to go away, and Mom cries in the corner. They haven't told me, but... I think it's Margaret. It isn't Margaret, I repeated sadly. Baby, she's been gone for a long time. I'm sorry. I know it's hard, but it isn't her. Maybe, she said complacently. You're right. I love you. She hung up the phone. I wish I had known that would be our last phone call. I would have made it last all night. I would have driven home and spent every minute with her from then on. I would have done everything differently. But I didn't. And I can't. My phone rang late in the evening the day after finals. I was lugging boxes from my shabby apartment to my car in preparation to make the final drive back home to Alistair Valley. Sliding the box from my hand onto the floor, I walked to the kitchen counter to look at the caller ID. Bruce Cupsworth's number flashed on the Nokia's green screen. I was puzzled since I didn't frequently talk to Paige's father on the phone. We had a great relationship and always enjoyed one another's company at family gatherings. He just wasn't a chatty man. A phone call was unusual unless something was wrong. Hello? I said, as I lifted my phone to my ear. Paige is gone, Bruce said in a wavering baritone. There was an alert last night, and she's gone. 
I could hear Paige's mother wailing in the background, and I could hear sniffling and the choking of sobs from her father. How? I asked. It was all I had been able to manage in my shock. The alert sounded during dinner, he muttered. Her mother and I headed to the basement. Paige said she was going to get her cell phone from her room to call you. When we came upstairs, the front door was standing open. We haven't seen her since. My heart dropped, and I couldn't speak. I felt like I should be crying, but no tears came. My brain told me to wail, but I couldn't. I just felt empty. Did Paige say anything strange to you the last time you spoke? Her father asked. Yeah, I stammered. She, uh, she said something about a little girl's voice outside the door during the alerts. I think she said it sounded like Margaret. Chris, he said, I should have told. No, never mind. We're having a memorial service for her tomorrow. Will you come? My heart began to race, and I could feel the heat rise to my face. A memorial service? I scoffed. You should be organizing a search party. She could still be out there. A moment of silence fell between us. Aren't you going to look for her? I begged. Christopher, he said in a broken monotone. You know this isn't how this works. Paige is gone. Just like Margaret. What the hell took her? I shouted. What is out there? Why do we have to hide? We aren't going to discuss this, he said, anger rising in his voice. It's hard enough with you trying to do this right now. Do what? I demanded. Ask why you aren't looking for your daughter? Ask why we have to hide in the dark and no one ever explains why? Do you even know? Yes, he replied. After Margaret was taken, the safety board met with us and explained some of it. Some of it? I yelled. Hot tears were streaming down my face. Your kids vanish and you just accept it? The phone line went dead. I tried calling Bruce multiple times, but it went directly to his voicemail. My attempts to call Miss Cupsworth went unanswered as well. Paige's parents never spoke to me again, and I don't blame them. They had suffered the horrific loss of their only two children, but in my hot-headed youth, I wasn't able to consider their sense of loss as I can now. In my early forties, I can see how unsympathetic I was to their grief and sorrow. I moved back to Alistair Valley after college, and I've been here ever since. The emergency alert system has been more advanced in the last few years. The strange pink and yellow vertical stripes and droning alarm on the television are still in place. Now we also receive Ember Alert-style warnings on our cell phones. The safety board even installed a powerful air raid siren on the outside of the courthouse. I'm in my forties now. My mother's health and mental state began to deteriorate rapidly after I moved back to town. The intent had always been to live with her for a few months while I got my feet on the ground and found my own place. When her dementia began to present itself, we made the decision that I would stay with her rather than move her into a care facility. Luck was largely on my side when I began to search for a job that would accommodate the time it took to care for my mother. A mid-sized publishing company out of New York hired me to work from home soon after college. The pay has never been astronomical, but it allows me to work at my own pace and keep my eye on mom. Over the years, as her dementia worsened, it became more difficult to keep mom in the basement when the emergency alert system activates. Eventually, I was forced to invest a good deal of money in having our old storm cellar converted into a finished basement. It's a comfortable place for her, and she spends most of her day down there reading. It greatly simplified things for when the alarms sounded. 
She had been combative when I tried to corral her to the cellar before I converted it into a studio apartment. Now, when the sirens sound, she is already securely placed and goes about her day without a care. When the alert would sound, I would sit by the door leading out of her downstairs apartment. Before I would go down there to wait it out with her, I always made sure the doors and windows were firmly locked. It gave me the illusion of safety, but it didn't stop the voices I had started to hear outside the door. Years ago, when I had first moved back to Alistair Valley, the emergency alert system had sounded my first night in town. Mom was still pretty sharp back then. We had moved into the cellar and listened to the weather radio for information. A few moments into the warning, I could hear something brushing against the metal doors. Chris. A hushed voice said through the barrier. It sounded like Paige. Chris, please let me in. I'm so scared. I began to cry immediately. Christopher. The voice implored. Please let me in. They're going to hurt me. My mother had walked behind me and placed a hand on my shoulder. It isn't her, my boy. She said in a soothing voice. I know you hear Paige talking, but it isn't her. I hear your father's voice out there right now. He's telling me how much he misses us and to open the door. It gets easier. That alarm lasted longer than usual. A voice that sounded hauntingly like Paige taunted me for nearly an hour. It said that if I would just open the door, it would explain where she had been. I was the only one that could save her. It was my fault that she had vanished. Through the years, I grew used to the haunting voice. My sorrow turned to anger at the taunts. Where my mother had once comforted me through them, I now spent my time comforting her dementia-ridden mind, who was now confused by the calls of my father. She forgot them quickly after the alerts, but the grief and woe in her eyes broke my heart. The amount of medication she is on to manage the worst of her symptoms is astonishing. Fortunately, the local pharmacy was accommodated in getting all of her medication refills lined up on the same day. The less time I had to spend out of the house at the pharmacy or the grocery store, the better. My mom needs around-the-clock care now. It wears me thin, but... I can't stand the thought of her withering away in a nursing home. When I pulled up to the pharmacy this afternoon, the tech, Chrissy, greeted me with a smile. She pulled the crinkly white bag off of the shelf and placed them in a brown paper bag. As she rang me up at the register, she furrowed her brow. Sorry, Chris, the young lady said. It looks like we only have four of the five medications in stock. The pharmacist transferred the one we didn't have over to Glendale so we could keep her fill dates lined up. Frustrated, I looked down at my watch. I had to stop at the grocery store before the pharmacy. It had been an hour and a half since I left Mom at home. The drive to and from Glendale would take at least 30 minutes if everything went smoothly. Two hours couldn't hurt, could it? Thanks, Chrissy, I said in as friendly a manner as I could. I'll head that way. I appreciate it. Chrissy handed me the bag, and I headed out the door. Settling in the driver's seat of my car, I pulled out my phone and called Mom. It went to her voicemail, just as I expected. I sent a text message explaining I would be out longer. She rarely saw my text messages, but I liked to do my best to get a hold of her when our routine changed. After a moment of waiting for a call or response text, it became clear I wouldn't hear from her. Not wanting to waste any more time, I put the car in drive and headed in the direction of Glendale. My mind was washed in anxiety of having to leave my mother at home alone for so long, but my options were limited. For a moment, I considered calling our neighbors to keep an eye on her, but that option had exhausted itself. The number of times that Ted and Helen had kept an eye on her had overwhelmed them over the years. Her temper, when they would try to keep her in or near the house, had worn them down. Abandoning the thought, I tossed my cell phone into the seat beside me. The trip took longer than I anticipated. 
When I finally arrived at the pharmacy in Glendale, it had taken over 25 minutes. The old road between our two towns was down to a single lane for resurfacing. It had taken the pharmacist an additional 10 minutes to fill the script. Their computer system looked as though it were cutting edge during the latter half of the Clinton administration, and the transfer had only arrived a few minutes before I walked in the door. I paid as quickly as I could and headed out to the car to get back on the road. Looking at my cell phone, I saw that my mother still hadn't called me back or returned my text message. The ocean of anxiety in my head was beginning to swell. It wasn't unusual for her to ignore her cell phone, but it never ceased to fill me with an unhealthy level of existential dread. My drive back to Alistair Valley was more forgiving than the drive to Glendale. When I reached the one-lane portion of the road, I had arrived just in time for the woman holding the stop sign to wave my line of traffic through. I waved a grateful hand in her direction, and she returned it with a smile. Small-town friendliness can be a welcome thing. By the time I was two blocks from my mother's house, my cell phone began to squeal wildly in the passenger seat next to me. Initially, I thought it was my mother calling, but my heart sank when I realized it was the emergency alert system. Slamming the gas pedal to the floor, I sped home as quickly as I could. I reached toward the radio and turned the volume knob up. From the emergency alert system of the Alistair Valley Safety and Protection, at this time, please seek shelter in a basement, storm shelter, or interior room of your house without windows. This is a level 5 watch. I repeat, this is a level 5 watch. Three entities have been spotted on and around West Vine Street, Chippendale Court, and Broadway Avenue. Remain indoors and away from windows until you receive an all-clear message from this channel. Only conditioned updates from the Alistair Valley Safety and Protection Board serve as factual information. This is a message from... The message began to play in a loop over and over. West Vine was only two streets away from our house on Sullivan Street. Sweat was pouring down my forehead and stinging my eyes. I punched the garage button from a block away and was thrilled to see it open when the front of our house came into view. Pulling the car into the garage, I surveyed the scene but didn't see anything out of the ordinary. The garage door began to close behind me and I jumped out of the car to head to the door. The groceries and medication would have to wait until after the morning. Milk and eggs could be replaced. I could not afford to wait any longer to get the cellar door secured and check on Mom. Racing to the house, I did my usual check of the doors and windows. Every lock was bolted and every window was secured. My pulse began to lower, and I could feel the anxiety drifting away as the safety of home soaked into my body. As I began to step onto the stairs of the cellar, I pulled the heavy metal doors shut behind me. Carefully, I slid the two bracer bars snugly into place. My hand drifted to the wall beside me, and my ears were filled with the familiar jingling of the padlock keys. After being reassured that the keys were securely in place, I began to click all ten padlocks into their loops. I turned and began to walk down the steps. My eyes wandered to the hooks that held the bolt cutter. It was always the last item on my mental checklist. If a padlock key ever went missing or one of the lock's mechanisms seized, it was good to have a backup plan. Dad had nearly perfected the art of our family lockdown during the sirens. Every time I entered this cellar to wait out the alarm, I sent him a silent prayer of thanks. He had graciously taken most of the thought out of this place before he passed away. Reaching the floor of the cellar apartment, I was initially surprised to see my mother's recliner sitting empty. Her iPhone sat on the side table next to the chair, flashing and beeping with the emergency alert. My eyes darted around the room, searching for her. Panic began to rise again until I noticed the bathroom door was shut. I walked to the door and knocked lightly. Hey mom, I said loudly. Sorry that it took me so long. I had to drive to Glendale to get some of your medication. I waited for a moment, but there was no response. Mom? You in there? I asked. Silence. I knocked and waited for a moment, but still received no response. After another moment of waiting, I jiggled the door handle and found it unlocked. 
Pushing it open, I looked inside. The light was off, so I flicked the switch on. The bathroom was empty. Storming around the cellar apartment, I began to call my mother's name, but received no reply. The area was small, with only a sitting room, bedroom, and bathroom. It didn't take long to realize she wasn't down there. My head began to swim. The garage door had been opened when I pulled into the driveway. Although I'd punched the opener from a block away, I had no idea if the signal reached that far away. She could have left through the garage and left the door open, and I would never know. I raced to the stairs and began to pull the keys from their pegs on the wall. Hours seemed to pass as I fumbled the keys into each lock. Generally, I would put them carefully back in their place on their loops, but I dropped them to the stairs and listened as they tumbled to the ground below. As I was about to step onto the main floor of the house above, I heard the alert system beep three times to indicate an update. 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 This is a message from the emergency alert system of the Alistair Valley Safety and Protection Board. At this time, please seek shelter in a basement, storm shelter, or interior room of your house without windows. This is a level 5 watch. I repeat, this is a level 5 watch. Twelve entities are actively moving on West Vine Street, Chippendale Court, Broadway Avenue, Sullivan Street, Clay's Mill Road, and LaGrange Road. The unusual amount of activity will extend the warning as a precaution. Please remain away from doors or windows. Whatever was out there was on my street. My heart pounded. I had to find my mother. I searched the house again. Although I had already checked all of the windows and door locks, I had not performed an exhaustive search of the house. I had never needed to in the past. Now I opened every door, searched in every closet, and checked behind every large piece of furniture, but found no sign of her. Cautiously, I opened the door leading into the garage and stepped down onto the concrete below. Scanning the room, there was still no sign of her. I was preparing to head back into the house again when I heard a voice out in the street. I thought you had died. I heard my mother's voice say, Christopher tells me that you died, but here you are. I've been waiting for you. Slowly, I crept to the garage door and looked out the window. My mother was standing in the center of the street in her house coat and slippers. Her hair was in disarray, and she clutched a newspaper in her right hand. In front of her stood my father, looking almost exactly the way I remember before he died. He wore the same pale blue jeans, short-sleeved button-up shirt, and white Nike sneakers he always had. His hair had turned an unearthly silver in comparison to the salt and pepper gray that I recalled. His mouth was cocked into the same amused smile that always seemed painted onto his face. His eyes, though, were black. The sun was shining, but there was no light reflecting off of them. It wasn't as much like looking into the darkness of a basement as it was staring into the empty void of space. No light obscured the darkness they held. I've missed you, my dear. I heard my father say, as he held his hand out to my mother. It's been so long, but we need not be apart any longer. Let me go get Christopher. My mother exclaimed. You'll be so happy to see you. No. My father shouted. He reached forward and took her hand firmly in his and began to walk down the street away from the house. I've come for you, my dear. We will send for Christopher later. My mother stumbled behind my father. She turned her head toward the house and dropped the newspaper as our eyes connected. The joy she had felt upon seeing this thing that looked like my father melted away into fear. Her feet became tangled, and she fell to the asphalt, but the terrible mirage of my father continued to drag her away. No. She shouted feebly. No, you let go of me. You're not my husband. Why are you doing this? 
Let go. In my shock, I had become frozen in place, but watched this thing drag my mother away helped me regain my will. I dashed to the switch for the garage door and punched it. The door opened so slowly that I decided to dive onto the floor and slide through the thin opening. Pushing myself back onto my feet, I readied myself to run after my mother. Before I could take action, I saw her. Paige was in the streets in front of me. I froze again. Her mother and father were walking with her, hand in hand. On the far side of the family, a little girl held tightly to Bruce Cupworth's hand. It was Margaret. I had not seen her in more than three decades, but I still recognized her. She wore the same pink-flowered dress that had been in the photo at her memorial. Paige turned her head toward me, and my eyes locked with the black sockets in her head. I knew it couldn't be, but it looked so much like her. The thing smiled at me and lifted a hand to greet me. My stomach turned to knots, and I felt like I would vomit at any moment. I'll be back, Christopher. She said, as she continued to walk down the street. I miss you, and we can be together soon. Paige's parents looked in my direction. Their faces, which initially looked joyful, quickly became grimaces of pain and fear. They both began to try to withdraw their hand from the clutches of the things impersonating their children, but were unable to break free. The air filled with a sound like snapping twigs, and they began to scream. The things were crushing the bones in their hands. Ahead of them, on the street, the thing mimicking my father turned around and smiled at the noise and terror. It looked at me and lifted its head in my direction. The thing smiled again, revealing rows of black, shining teeth. It crouched to the ground by my mother and began to shake. All at once, the changeling things began to shake violently. Their limbs began to grow thin and long. The clothing on their bodies began to shred and break away as painfully thin torsos stretched them past their limit. Their skin, which had looked normal moments ago, began to bubble. Pale, peach skin curdled into lumpy black and gray flesh. They all stood at once, stooped over to keep a grip on their victims. At full height, each of the obsidian beasts would have stood as tall as a two-story house. Their spines curled to the side as they hunched over, allowing their stick-thin arms to drag my mother and the Cupsworths away. The three nightmarish creatures sank low on two legs and their free hand and began rapidly moving down the street, pulling their victims behind them. My mother and the Cupsworths screamed and clawed at the ground in a fruitless attempt to slow the creatures as they bolted from sight. I could still hear them wailing in despair long after they vanished from my line of sight. In the background, the emergency alert siren roared endlessly. I stumbled back inside and collapsed onto the kitchen floor. There was no need to hide in the basement. The things had already gotten what they came for. It has been two weeks since the last emergency warning. A town record I have since found out. The Alistair Valley Safety and Protection Board sent a man to my house the day after my mother was taken by those things. He didn't threaten me but there was a subtle undertone that told me declining to go with him to the board's office was not an option. I rode in the back of a Ford Taurus with tinted windows to the outskirts of town. When we pulled up to the nondescript white building, the man who picked me up told me to ring the buzzer on the door and tell them my name. They would let me in and talk to me. When I was done, he would drive me home. Feeling lost and hopeless after the events of the previous day, I did as he asked. I pressed the buzzer, and a man asked my name. I answered, and heard the heavy metal door lock disengage. 
The man told me to come inside and wait in the lobby. When I entered, I looked around. Lobby was a generous term for this stiflingly hot room. There were two folding metal chairs pushed up against the wall and an empty coffee table in the center of the room. A water cooler sat empty in the corner. It smelled of cigarettes and sweat. The only other door in the room creaked open and a gruff-looking man stood in the frame. He was over six feet tall with a bushy beard that hung down onto his pot belly and a mess of brunette hair pulled back into a sloppy ponytail. His steel-toed work boots tapped impatiently on the fading linoleum floor. A pair of faded blue jeans and sweat-stained white t-shirt seemed like poor work attire. You Chris? The rough man grunted. Yeah, I replied flatly. That would be me. He waved me in his direction and walked back into the room. I followed without considering what may be on the other side. Having seen my mother dragged away by a horrific creature the day before, my sense of self-preservation was low. The room I entered was much cooler than the waiting area. Black and white monitors covered two of the walls flickering between different views of Alistair Valley. I watched them in a trance as they transitioned to dozens of places around town that I recognized and a few I was less familiar with. In the center of a room sat a semicircle desk with a comfortable-looking rolling chair behind it. The burly man sat at the desk looking at the monitors. Without looking at me, he motioned to his left to a folding metal chair beside me. Have a seat, he said. We need to talk. I sat next to him and continued to look at the screen. My name is Harlan Matthews, the man said. Been working for the board for about 15 years, give or take. Used to work the night shift, but I'm on days now. I nodded, but said nothing. So, I understand you saw our visitors, he stated. Sad business. I'm sorry for your loss. I understand it ain't your first go around with losing someone like this. Yeah, I muttered. Paige Cupsworth a long time ago. My mother... Yesterday, he nodded and took a long drag of his cigarettes that had been smoldering in an ashtray on the desk. Chris, he stated, I'm going to give you the same brief sliver of information that I and the other board members share when someone loses a family member. I know you and Paige were close, but we only talk with immediate family members. Now that your mother passed away, you get to hear it too. Harlan smoked the last of his cigarette and crushed it out into the ashtray before immediately lighting another one. First of all, we have no clue what the things are. They've been around since the town has. From what we know, they try to mimic people you were close to and draw you out. Must be some kind of mind reading or something. Not like we've been able to ask them or anything. Anyway, anyone dumb enough to listen to these things gets dragged away and never returns. I nodded again, and Harlan pounded a hand on my back in what I assumed was a gesture of comfort. Not many people see them and live to tell the tale, he grunted. You have, and it comes with a price. What price? I blurted. Whatever they looked like to you yesterday is what they'll always look like to you. He said, as he made the first real eye contact of the entire conversation. And you'll start seeing them more often. You'll see them, and that makes them want you. It ain't like they hunt you, but they take some kind of special interest in the people who see them and live. Harlan pulled a drawer out of the desk and fished a card out. He handed it to me. I turned it over in my hand. One side was blank but the other held a local phone number. Underneath, the number was printed for emergencies only. You ever heard a level one or two warning? He asked. Of course you have. You were born here. You see any of the people who you saw yesterday, you call us. We sound the alarm. People live. You do your duty, I do mine. Understand? 
Yeah, I said, as I bobbed my head up and down. Just call the number if I see them. Good man, Harlan said, adding another brutal comfort swat on my right shoulder. We got a memorial together for your ma down at the community center tonight at 7 p.m. Sorry for your loss. Yesterday, before those things changed, they looked like my father, Paige, and her sister, Margaret. I said to Harlan, is that what they looked like to you on the screen? Harlan sat silent for a moment and smoked his cigarette. No, he said without emotion. Not much want to talk about what I see. You said you saw your dad? I nodded. Harlan pulled a notebook from the desk and began jotting notes. Something wrong? I asked. Yeah, he replied as he continued writing. No one ever said the things looked like someone that the things hadn't before. It's worth sharing with the others. Change ain't a good thing with these critters. Harlan walked me out of the building and sent me to the car. Once I got home, I sat and thought about everything the man had told me. The grief and discovery were an overwhelming combination that left my head swimming. I did what any son would do, and stood in a receiving line later that night at a memorial service the Safety and Protection Board set up. Next to me was a framed photo of my mother, before dementia, lined with flowers, eternally happy, eternally herself. I shook the hand of just about every person in town. It was no comfort, but I think it made them feel better. Since that day, I've seen my mother, father, and all of the Cupsworths multiple times. They are usually standing in tall grass or leaning out from behind trees. Sometimes they are in my backyard, and others follow me down the aisle at the supermarket. If you live in Alistair Valley, then I'm certainly the organization point of one of the many emergency alerts you hear. I'm sorry, but I'm also not. It keeps you safe. And if you wonder why I don't leave to get away from all this, I ran the idea by Harlan once. He explains to me that the risk that these things would leave Alistair Valley to follow me and spread to other places was too great. It was similar to when the man picked me up to go see him. No threat of violence was issued, but there was an understanding that leaving now that I've seen the things wasn't an option. I'll be haunted by my family and the woman I loved until I'm dead. For better or worse, I've accepted this. My hope is you won't have to live in the same hell that I do. Paige and my mother speak to me most often through the cellar door during the alerts. I don't cry anymore. In fact, hearing their voices is comforting sometimes. It shouldn't be, but I miss them. One day, I'm almost certain I will go with them just to end all of this. Anyhow, I have to go make a call. I can see Paige sitting on a bench across the street from my house through the living room window. Harlan or one of the others needs to sound the alarm. <laughs>